Hi, I'm M. And my name is B. And this is Fangirls Fan Anonymous. Anonymous. A quick warning, this podcast is not for kids. We get into some pretty explicit stuff. But if you're still with us and into that, welcome. How are you, B? <laughs> Doing pretty good. How about yourself? I am very good. I had a delicious meal at a vegetarian Indian place tonight, and there was so much flavor packed into such a small amount of serving of potato and cauliflower. It was so good. Our episode has nothing to do with anything about Indian food. <laughs> <laughs> Indian food fans, raise your hand, even though this is a podcast. Anyway, what are we talking about this episode, B? We are starting our ship series, and we're going to start with one of the old ones, one of the quintessential ones, the ones that you think of when you think of ships, and that would be <laughs> Spurk. Although, I'm going to put out there right now that that portmanteau, which is Spock Kirk, is actually a really new one, and that for most fans over the years, they're probably actually going to know it better as K slash S. I didn't start reading uh, Spurk Thick until very, very recently, so... To me, it's always Spurk, but, like, was it KS even in fanzines? We'll get into that, but, like, it's yeah. been that long, right? Yeah. Very much so. So, when I'm talking about probably the older stuff, for the most part, I'm going to refer to it as KS because that's what it was referred to. Very exciting to be starting our, our series on ships. We've decided to call it USS and then the ship name, which is fun. Especially because this is our first episode and it's the USS Enterprise in the show and the movie series. So fun little play on words. <laughs> we are English majors. <laughs> so the beginning. The beginning. <laughs> and by the beginning, we mean the beginning. Like when the show came out in the 60s. Imagine, if you will, it is the late 60s. You are quite privileged if you have a color TV or a TV of any kind. And on the television, there comes a wondrous new show by Gene Roddenberry called Star Trek. It is filled with lots of primary colored individuals who are in a spaceship traveling to worlds unknown. This is a bold new thing. It's got Russians, which was a pretty ballsy thing to do during the middle of the Cold War. It's got people of color. You've got Sulu and Ohura. You've got a couple of other smattering of characters. You have an alien, Mr. Spock. And you have our brave captain. And this show was decently popular at the time. What we're going to get into is the hundreds of thousands of people who decided that this was a really cool show and they wanted more than what they got every week on their TV. Fan fiction. Indeed. Despite what this episode is called, I'm going to put out there first and foremost that Spock Kirk was not most people's knee-jerk fic go-to in the beginning. It just, it wasn't. Both because at the time there was a lot of social backlash, I was would put it as, against queer people. It was not talked about. It was not considered in polite society. It wasn't something that most people were super comfortable with. But it wasn't just that it was slash. It was that, to be honest, a lot of the early Star Trek stuff didn't tend to be super based on romance at all. A lot of the first stuff was sort of continuing missions of the lot of Jen. Occasionally there were some friendship fic, which it's important to note here that the nomenclature K slash S, at the time the slash was not standardized as a means of communicating a sexual relationship or a romantic relationship. It was just a strong relationship, a relationship that was a focal point of the story. That's crazy. Yeah. Because nowadays, people don't even want to use it as a slash anymore to indicate that that was a thing. It's like, people don't realize that it originally wasn't even meant to be a sexual relationship. It's funny how mm -hmm. things change over time, which is literally life. But like... <laughs> yeah, it, it is absolutely weird because you can say completely factually that there were K slash S stories in the 60s, but also that <laughs> we have no real evidence of K slash S stories from the 60s because you're talking about two different things. It's theorized because as with a lot of Spanish history, this is sort of an oral history and a lot of the actual physical evidence of it one way or the other is kind of lost. But it's theorized that K slash 
S didn't just emerge spontaneously at some point codified, but that what actually happened is that there was some drawer fic that got passed around at this time. Drawer fic is a term that refers to fic that people didn't, it, it was not circulated to a wider audience. The actual term refers to like the idea of putting a fic in a drawer and not taking it out for anybody but yourself or a small group of friends to read. So there were probably stories that circulated, but there are no copies left that most people can get their hands on. It would be so cool to be able to read something like that. Oh my god. I'm sure that somebody has cleaned out their grandmother's attic and found some and yes. been like, oh, I don't know what this is, and moved Everybody, right please, go to your grandmother's. Find the fic. It's out there. <laughs> and then send it to us. <laughs> <laughs> so... Having said that, we do know it existed because there were a couple of fic that are very early examples of KS that exist that did end up getting sort of brought forward in time. One of the most famous examples is a story called The Ring of Sochern. This was originally a drawer fic that got circulated in a small audience, but that audience liked it enough that they started sort of making their own copies and distributing more until like eventually the first design. not quite because the thing about it is they actually a copy of it got printed in a zine several years later like almost Ooh. a decade i believe but without author permission oh no um, that sucks and that made it quite controversial but the reason we have it is because the design brought it forward. So we knew it existed and we knew that there had to have been some communities that did talk about it because it was decently codified by the time you started getting into the 70s. When you got into the 70s, you started actually, through a combination of just the fan base growing and zines becoming more available and more popular, people arranging conventions, and also the social movements happening at the time, you started seeing this idea being discussed in kind of more publicly recorded forums. And at the time, the actual, the polite conversation way of referring to it was the premise. Um, oh, it's so cool. That makes it sound so cool to me. <laughs> there was a lot of debate about it. The, the premise was seen as sort of offensive or outlandish to a lot of fans because, again, it was still the 60s, 70s. The idea of being openly queer was still very taboo. I mean, this is post-Stonewall riots. Still, though, it, it was not well accepted. It was not I mean, something like now where you could stick two characters in a gay ship and everybody sort of in the community shrugs their shoulder and goes, sure, fine, live and let live. This was something that people yeah. talked about and thought about and had a lot of complicated emotions about. I will say that fan fiction history is queer people history, so... They overlap. Like... They're very close to being one circle in a Venn diagram. <laughs> so the 70s, like I said, zines were becoming more available. So this is where we start really getting some very solid, like, we've got the proof examples, which was quote-unquote the first KS. Nobody really knows because, again, drawer fic and maybe some very limited distributions of zines that got lost or so on and so on. But this is where you start being able to point out, hey, this was what it was. There were some that were more blatant than others. Others. So there was a story called The Green Plague, which I wouldn't say that it was blatant, but it was there. It was sort of a, a hat tip and a wink at the end that was pretty clear that's what they intended. Cute. It's interesting because on the flip side of that, where that one was sort of within taste of the time in so mm. far as it goes. On the other opposite side, a very contemporary to that piece was called A Fragment Out of Time Alternately, it was republished as To Invite the Night, although it's unclear why, because that was also the name of the original design it was in. I'm going to refer to it as a fragment out of time, because I believe that's its earliest title that we have in print. And in this one, it was a piece of porn, basically, but it was written <laughs> <Fun>. <laughs> in a very strange style where I believe it was from first person, or at least the point of view was obscured, and it was implied to be Spock, who was having this sexual encounter with another person, who it's not 100% clear within the space of the fic who that person is. Um, How did they do that? Very amorphous. But having said that, there is a line in there that people point to that says the second person is probably Kirk. And later, the author came out with an essay in which they sort of outed themselves and said, yes, it definitely is KS, and this is why it's okay. That they defended themselves and the ship in general. 
again, it's interesting because they're sort of opposite, those two are sort of opposite ends of the spectrum in, in terms of how they were approaching the ship. One of them was like, it's basically strong friendship, but also they probably banged. <laughs> the other person going, oh, they definitely banged, see? But we're not going to tell you about it. Amazing. How did they even do that? Uh, How did they even write a fic about somebody having sex with somebody and not even <laughs> one hint for it being Kirk? That's crazy. Point of view is wonderful, as is pronouns. Did they He used they the entire time? I he? don't know, because I don't actually have a copy of this. This oh, is, I will sorry. admit, somehow, somewhat secondhand knowledge, just because it is extremely hard to get a copy of these stories, because they were printed in Zines. As Zines started publishing this content, it was really still tied in strongly with the idea of it being adult content. Like, if it was published, it was in a Zine that automatically came with a higher rating. For example, uh, there was a Zine called Grup, which is a reference to an episode of Star Trek in which they are on a planet where only children live, basically at, at a certain age when they get start getting into adulthood they die and all of the children on the planet call adults grups so it's a grown-up magazine is essentially what it's calling itself and that's the sort of places that if there was ks it would get published that is a fascinating history for that title hey we're all dead might as well do ks fan fiction <laughs> it was more along the lines of because it it talks about queerness it isn't appropriate mm. for well, people yeah. below a certain age. Which is not what people can think about nowadays <laughs> with fic. I mean, like, there are 13-year-olds writing smut every day on AO3, so. Yeah, but. I mean, it's definitely, there's contention, obviously, from what I just said. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's definitely not as stringent or strict now, I would say. And, again, it wasn't keeping whoever wanted their hands on it. It was definitely a perception that it even was if, meant for adults. Even if your story was, by our standards today, very, like, E for everyone, like, <laughs> fairy tale esque they kiss at the end and that's it, they would still get published in these sort of higher-rated zines because they were homosexual. Having said that, this debate and this perception, it was a wider community thing. Um, even as chaos sort of gained some momentum and people became more familiar with the idea, it was... It wasn't seen as sort of obscene, which leads to the great sequester con disaster of six of 76. This con is infamous for two things. The first is that they had several panels which were about the great, about the premise, about Kirk Spock. And they had quite a few people discussing it very kind of heatedly. And they had some trouble actually filling up both sides of the panel, just in terms of people for, people against. And people knew going in that this was going down, that there were people for it and against it, and they were here to sort of duke it out. Now, unfortunately, the disaster part of the disaster is one of the panelists was in a panel defending... I believe an argument, I'm not sure it was the same panel, but it was an argument essentially trying to explain why Kirk Spock shouldn't be a thing. And in doing so, they were reading an excerpt from a fic that was fairly explicit. Now, the problem was that oh, the no. hotel staff had a mistake oh, no. with their PA system. And so no. well, they thought that they were only reading this aloud into the room of people who were in the panel. They were actually reading it out to everybody at the Holy shit balls <gasps> which is not a great thing to be remembered as the person who was reading star trek erotica in the middle of a con <laughs> no. over the pa system no. i feel i am feeling secondhand embarrassment almost 50 years from yeah. now a lot of people came away from the con kind of conflating these two things that star trek fandom was very hot and heavy um, maybe in a not-so-great way, and also that KS was just okay there, which was very scandalous and sort of offensive to a fair number of people. Mm, yeah. It didn't help that there was a whole lot of other things going on between the creators of the show and the fans at this point, because fans, being who they are, were sort of trying to get 
the the show creators to throw in their two cents. And there were writers on the show who were vehemently against the idea that no, they were written as straight characters, they must be straight. And there were other people who just sort of smiled and waved and were like, that's nice, and moved on with their lives. A lot of the actors from what I have read were very much like, that's lovely, and went right on with their lives and did not comment. Roddenberry mm. himself is an interesting case because... When he was conceptualizing the show, he had sort of a hard time figuring out what to do with Spock because he intended originally to basically just have Kirk be his protagonist. But then but everybody really... loved Spock, right? Yeah, everybody loved yeah. Spock. And so he's like, well, dang, I guess I need to make him important. Interestingly, Ismov, the author Isaac Ismov, actually wrote him a letter about what he thought he should do. And in his case, he was basically like, show people this great friendship, make it very brothers of the ages sort of a thing. Thing. I believe at some point one or the other of them brought up Alexander and Hephaestion. Please do tell me if I have just mispronounced his name terribly because now I have a great fear of that. Point being, they brought up a set of historical figures who are at this point sort of widely acknowledged to probably have been lovers. So, you know, that's the premise from which they were born. Later, Roddenberry said that he sort of envisioned Kirk, Spock, and McCoy as separate parts of, of himself as sort of this grand triumvirate of characters who balanced each other out and created sort of a, a renaissance man. Like, together the three of them could do anything. Even from their conception by the by the, the creator's own admission, they were always meant to be very, very close and have a strong relationship. Whether or not it was intended to be homosexual, Roddenberry had a tendency to sort of slide right by that question. Sure, fine if you'd like, but probably not okay, sure. He was wishy-washy back and forth, tailored it to who he was speaking to. Uh, a man who knew not to stick his foot in his mouth in front of a bunch of rabid fans. Yes, you're right. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting that some of the tropes that at least I think of as sort of an early internet sort of a, a shtick had, I think, the first inklings here. There were, of course, many tropes born in this fandom. Uh, aliens made them do it. That was definitely a, a chaos thing. That was a thing that happened. They had this uh, wonderful trope, which part of me wants to bring back and part of me does not, which was called cave fic, which Ooh. in true Star Trekian fashion, something bad happened and there was a convenient cave. That they oh my god, I've in. read it. It's so fun. <laughs> I, it's, I feel like just a very hyper-focused bottle episode, but at the same time, mm. I just have a deep and abiding love for sticking a character in a confined space and saying, you know, talk to each other, have emotional problems. God, me too. It's just wonderful character development. But the one that, that really interests me is the idea of a decent amount of KS being not so much coming out as, I guess, a first-time experience. Like, almost a, I have never loved someone like you before in all meanings of the phrase. And, you know, this is all a very new experience, but also at the same time sort of coming out as this being a part of their identity. Which is interesting because I feel like it's almost the societal equivalent of an early internet fandom coming out fic. Where hmm. they are coming out, but it's still a very private thing, so it's kept in between just the two individuals. It's it's really interesting to me. It's like they're figuring out each other together. There's also uh, the really famous sex pollen stuff, right? I did not read about that specifically in relation to this, but I have to assume yes. Yeah. I would assume yes, too, because like that's where it started in the show, in the canon, so I'm assuming it's in the fic, too. Yeah. Even the older stuff. At this point, there's a, a not a lot more that I can say about this particular era of the fandom, except for the fact that, sort of, as you traveled out from the 70s through to the, the 90s, zines were produced. KS... I wouldn't argue became more popular, although in so much as it became more accepted, and as the fandom grew, the amount of content that went with it grew apace. So there were, I believe, zines that were at some point actually just KS. Again, generally sort of rated for higher content. It also became sort of a joke. It was parodied within fandom. People made <laughs> quips and cracks about it as it became accepted enough for that to be acceptable. But 
uh, the interesting part about it is actually that as you sort of crept through to early internet fandom, you still had Trekkies doing it the same way they'd always done it, um, with not a ton of adaptation. They still did snail mail and newsletter groups and physical zines up through. I found a zine, a Star Trek, not KS necessarily, but it was a zine that was produced and printed in 2004, which is crazy. Wow, that is crazy. <laughs> um, but as I said, the fandom grew, the amount of KS content grew apace, and when you get to the early internet fandom, they did use some parts of the internet. In particular, they quite liked Usenet, which I will admit to having no experience with. But apparently it was, of all fandoms, they were the fandom that sort of took it over. I didn't even know Usenet was literally a thing until this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even heard of it. Quick apology to people who actually use say it like zine. BNI just say zine. We're sorry. But since on the early internet there was this ability to sort of make niche spaces within fandom even, Chaos sort of got its its feet under it. It had its own little niche where if you wanted it, you could find it. You didn't have to worry about trying to find a specific group and a specific zine that would publish it and so on and so on. You could just have archives and things. And actually, it was the first instance of an all-ages KS archive happened during this era. It had never happened before. It was always sort of rated higher. So, you know, progress. And honestly, that's sort of where it, it trickles off. As you get through early internet up through 2004 and 5, what Trekkies who were still active in fandom sort of kept on keeping on. And while Chaos was acknowledged and known, it was never the major ship. I would argue that from what I've seen, there were no major ships. That wasn't the nature of the fandom or the show. It was not what fans were really looking for in the original series. It's bananas to me. It's bananas that that's the case because, I don't know, growing up in fandom like I did, I always heard just on the, the edges and the periphery of history of fandom that, like, Kirk Spock, Spurk, is just like, that's the old ship. That's like the ship that your foremothers shipped in their, like, little physical signs that they would get in the mail, you know? But apparently... <laughs> History actually is not that. <laughs> oh yeah, it was there, and it was a ship, but... But it wasn't the ship, which no, is what I it got. Was a controversial ship in a fandom where shipping wasn't the end-all be-all, and never really ended up that way. I mean, there's a reason it produced the Mary Sue. It was because mm -hmm. people didn't want to ship the show characters together. <laughs> they, would, they were just going to make up an entire OC for that. Well, let's just say that I, for one, am very grateful to the horny housewives out there from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and early early aughts that they, they were doing that and that they made it within a certain circles socially acceptable to be able to ship whoever they wanted, like, gender be damned. So, everything changed when J.J. Abrams attacked. <laughs> 2009 changed it all, folks. The AOS series, or the alternate original series, happened. Started in 2009, which was helmed by J.J. Abrams, who didn't even like, and doesn't even like, currently, Star Trek. What is even up with that? What the fuck? Anyway, it exists. I... Okay, so the first movie came out in 2009. I would have been 11 or 12. I think it was 11. And I watched it at a drive-in theater and I loved it. This was actually my first like interaction with Star Trek as a story and it was really fun watching Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto be these characters that obviously I had seen because like Kirk and Spock are very into just like the zeitgeist of humanity in the United States and I'm sure everywhere around the world but it was just really fun to watch. I was 11, I didn't have as much discernment as I do now, and I just recently watched the movie again. It's okay. It's a little slow. Um. <laughs> it has not aged as well as one might hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really hasn't. But it definitely has a way different vibe than the original series. Yeah, I grew up on the movies. Let's just say I watched all of them in the theater, and I enjoyed all of them, but that came from a perspective of somebody who did not have any ex any experience with the with TOS the TOS until about 2 months ago 
I actually have started to actually watch the original series and it's so fun. It is so fun. And that has also made me start reading a lot of the fic. But there's a, almost a dividing line between the fic before the 2009 film series and, and after the 2009 film series. Basically, J.J. Abrams and his writers and his producers all, they weren't extending what happened in TOS. They made the AOS, the alternate original series. So mm -hmm. it's like hot young people <laughs> in movies. How did they, how did these new hot young versions of these characters get started again, basically? And it is very different. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a very different vibe. So obviously there's going to be very different vibes within the fandoms of the TOS fandom and the AOS fandom. And it is like it's a different fandom. You can tell when you're reading a fic that it is pre-2009 and post-2009. And the mm -hmm. thing is, I will say that it coming out, the first movie coming out in 2009, it was primed to become a new fandom because 2009 is the year that AO3 became a website. 2009 was kind of a, a the perfect year for it to come out in order to start a new Star Trek fandom. But the problem is it like waylaid, just like sidelined the old fandom a little bit. And I think that that kind of created a rift between them. I'm just spitballing here, but I really think that it created a, a rift between the two. I'm gonna put out there with my two cents. I was raised on the original series, longtime family fans, and then I also grew up with the alternate original series and there were pieces of the alternate series that just the recreating of the canon and the let's make them younger and more beautiful and flashier and do more cg was alienating to a lot of original series fans also the fact that the original series had this huge continuity not just with the other branching off shows that happened thereafter of which i think in 29 there were five maybe six Dang. But there are dozens of novels that expand the yeah. universe just within the original series. So some hotshot director who apparently doesn't even like this series he coming didn't. in, cutting it off at the stem and transplanting it into a different universe was super alienating because it was taking <sighs> these beloved characters and becoming something else. So a lot of old fans, I don't think, latched on to the new canon at all. Now that I've seen some of the, new, the old show, I now completely understand why the old fans were like uh what the fuck is this shit but when i was young i remember ha like hearing controversy like oh it's not as good i'd be like no nah, it's a fun movie why are you excited about it it's about your like your favorite people no it's not like the characters are different it's like a fan fiction of the old show like a fan fiction from somebody who sort of read like the wiki summary and sort of yes! understands it yes! and then was like just so you know i haven't actually ever watched the show so i but i'm good here's the fic anyway like all mistakes are mine and you're like okay mm -hmm. i know what i'm getting into i guess not to say that the aos movies aren't fun i'm from the perspective of watching it without having any background knowledge and like really liking kirk and spock i really like zachary quinto's like perspective and opinion of how to play him. I really liked him, and I really liked Kirk, and I really liked Uhura, and I really liked Sulu, but I now understand why people did not like the movies. Anyway, there's controversy, obviously, between the two, the two factions, but there's also some controversy just within the AOS fandom as well about different ships. So obviously there's Kirk Spock, but there's also Kirk McCoy, and there's also Spock Uhura, because I want, I don't know actually if that was a ship that people had in the TOS fandom, but it's Not definitely an AOS fandom. Yeah, I don't know if that was a thing. I mean, it was the 70s and racism, but... Uh, also, just Spock and O'Hara almost never interacted, so it was hard well, to in the... get a pin on their chemistry. I think in the first or second episode, Uhura sings to, to Spock in, while he's playing one of the fun alien instruments that he can play. Uh, it's um, not that they don't, it's that you almost yeah. never see them interact. But that's because Uhura only ever gets a couple of lines every couple of episodes, so. And without that character, we wouldn't have Whoopi Goldberg. Look it up, it's very interesting. So, obviously, there's strife in the fandom about Spock and Uhura being together in canon, and there were some places, like, online that didn't allow Spurk stuff to happen, but other places allowed it because of that canon very weird. 2009 was a strange cowboy place. It was the wild, wild west. Anyway, most importantly with controversy surrounding the AOS fandom is the SEE -E controversy. So on fanfiction.net, there were message boards and there was a message board that was about Spurk. Um, and somebody 
came up with the idea of a petition titled Social Equality Effort, or SEE for short. And the original idea was to start a petition basically to get the writers of the next Star Trek film to include a gay relationship in the film. Originally, it was a lot of people signed it in order for Kirk, Spock to happen, basically. Like, that was kind of the, that's what I want personally as a thing. It wasn't necessarily what the petition was about, but a lot of the people who signed it specifically signed it saying, please make Kirk, Spock a thing. And people in the thread and slashers and other slashers and like LGBT people eventually perceived the petition to be a petition only for Spurk to become canon. And it wasn't just a petition for LGBT representation in general in the film, um, which they did eventually get with Sulu and Ben in the 2016 film. But mm -hmm. it was kind of especially bad because Uhura and Spock are canon in the films. So it's like, okay, let me, let me read you this quote that I found on fanlore.com, which is where I found this information. Instead of getting racism activists on board, we are forcing them to choose between supporting an interracial and yes, also interspecies relationship and supporting a gay one. Are we really going to make people choose? Uhura is an important character, not only by being a person of color, but also one of the few main female characters. And how other characters interact with her is also important. Um, they were a KS fan that uh, disagreed with the petition. So eventually, they did change the petition to just be like, no, we just want a gay couple. Um, they changed the wording of it a little bit, but it just kind of fizzled out because people were like, uh, you just want this ship that you shipped to be canon. This isn't worth our time as an LGBT like petition. And that was kind of bad for like, in general, the whole idea of like, f you know, spark a little bit. <laughs> it seemed like these people really wanted these two people to get together in canon, basically. But there was already a wonderful ship that was happening in the sh in the show. What a lot of people considered a wonderful ship because of the diversity. It was pretty bad press, kind of, for fan figures at the time. I would mm -hmm. say. <laughs> but yeah, AOS is interesting. It was really good fic. Within the notes, I've actually added a link to a book that they wrote. It was not about KS specifically. It's actually about the history of Star Trek zines. It's cool. called Boldly Writing by Joan Verba, and it's so neat it, she's a longtime fan she has gone out she's talked to people she knew, knows she's found the history it's a really cool resource so if you want to know more about some of the, the other points of history here i would 100 percent recommend looking at the links in our notes because there's a lot more here anyway wreck corner so my wreck this week uh is called my golden sun slash kinkur las hark tanashve i don't know if i pronounced that correctly but i tried by giddy tf2 it is a, it's the first Spurk fic that I have ever read, and it is just some warnings, a lot of sex, it's ABO, there's MPreg, but it's very sweet, and I know that there was an article about it in a British newspaper, and that's kind of neat. Anyway, it's really good. So my rec this week is Bluebird by Waldorf. This one comes with no warning, so if you like something that's a little bit less squeaky, this is the one for you. It's also not super long. It is set in the alternate original series, and it is set actually after the third film, and it's sort of Kirk picking up the pieces and figuring out himself and his life and what he wants and sort of his love affair with or it's not even a love affair it's just him sort of pining after Spock and then I won't spoil the ending but it's really really good I would also strongly recommend the pod fic by R.S. Creighton she does a beautiful fic it is one that I've listened to over and over again it's really good it's really sweet so if you just need something nice and, and short and sweet this, this is the one for you I forgot to say that mine is also AOS Probably should have found a TOS one that we really liked, but alas. Mm. Anyway, I guess that's it. So I uh, guess we'll see y'all next week. Oh, and Fangirls Anonymous. Bye! <laughs>